Hello, good afternoon to all and thank you for coming to this event. My name is Varun Shrivastava and I welcome you all to this session on experiential learning. This event is broadly divided into two parts. First, we have the chat between uh, Rajiv Bafna and Satyama Chatterjee, the two industry veterans on their experiences spanning multiple decades through various times, through internet boom, through the internet bubble burst, the great recession and the time after that. So that we can learn how we, what we can expect after these challenging times, followed by a session on the application of common sense by Madhav Kaushik in natural language processing. I would request you all participants to keep yourselves on mute during the session. If you have a question, please do type that in the window on your channel. We have time reserved uh, towards the end of it where we can answer as many questions as we can. So without taking much time, I'm going to introduce Satyama Chatterjee, the one half of this Fireside Chat. Satyama is a seasoned analytics professional with more than 18 years of global multidimensional experience in the application of analytics and data science across industry veterans. Currently, he is the executive vice president of client solutions and product strategy for Analytica Data Lab. In 2019, he was among the top 10 data scientists in India by Analytics India magazine. Welcome, Satyamoy. Joining him on this fireside chat is the founder and CEO of Analytica Data Lab, Rajiv Bafna. Rajiv has more than three decades of experience in the field of analytics. He has enabled not only companies, but entire industries to adopt analytics across group. I will leave the detailed introduction of Rajiv Satyamoy in the segment to follow, as I believe that will do more justice to Rajiv's introduction and journey in the space. Thank you, Rajiv and Satyamoy for joining us. To avoid any interruptions in the chat, we are going to play a live recording of the session. However, Rajiv and Satyamoy are present with us and they will be available live for a Q&A uh, session of, after this session. So let's get the ball rolling. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Satyamoy Chatterjee. I welcome all the participants who took the time to join from different locations today. I was told that we have uh, multiple registrations coming in from different time zones as well. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you based on where you are located now. First of all, let me express my gratitude for the entire uh, team in enabling this event uh, in a short notice, especially when everybody is pretty good. Uh, thank you to our partner Crowd Product for facilitating the show as well. This is 100% online and being streamed through different avenues live. Uh, it's, my, it's my pleasure today to welcome Rajiv Bafna in this discussion. Rajiv uh, doesn't really need an introduction if you follow the analytics and AI space. He has been one of the pioneers of the applied analytics field when it comes to business integration. In a career spanning across three decades and multiple geographies across the globe, Rajiv had the opportunity to play diverse roles with a particular focus on creating business impact. Having also been the CFO of a 10 billion asset portfolio of one of the top 10 global banks. He is known for creating and leading structures around centers of excellence and enterprise products and solutions. He has also been globally recognized on multiple occasions as one of the influential leaders in the field of analytics and AI. Many of you would know Analytica has been here for a little more than seven years now. Rajiv started it in 2012 with a powerful vision of making analytics and AI mainstream when it comes to creating business impact through objective decision making. Analytica is an analytics and AI platform solutions company with an innovative culture. We have clients across the globe, across industry verticals, and our primary focus is to create business impact by leveraging our patented innovative product solutions. Recently, we opened up the relevant parts of our B2B offerings to take it out there for everybody to come and experience for learning, application, and owning their solution skills. So later part of this event today, we will uh, walk you through ATH Leaps, where Madhav Kausik, VP Client Solutions Analytica, 
through a workshop will give you a hands-on experience of this innovation. Mm -hmm. So the objective of uh, the next uh, 30 minutes is to hear from Rajiv to understand his perspectives, have him dwell into incidences from his career and uh, life to get a few takeaways which can uh, potentially help all of us here to reflect on and possibly help steer our careers in the right direction. So, uh, so let's get started. Uh, Rajiv, uh, welcome again. And uh, needless to say, Rajiv, we are uh, witnessing unprecedented times. Uh, many schools of thoughts uh, have, have started to firmly believe that uh, we are at an inflection point that will mark the advent of a new normal. Uh, given the times we are in, uh, what is in store ahead, uh, wanted to start with getting your perspective, particularly so if you can uh, uh, relate circumstances in the past that may that may come close to what we are witnessing now and uh, throw some light and relate it to your experiences that will be a great start to start with okay thank you satimoy i think it's uh, it's a great question uh, glad to be here thank you all for enabling this and participating as well um, so uh, i have, i'd like to share a few things a few perspectives right from uh, I started work uh, sometime uh, in mid 1990 or around around 1990 or so, and it's been a solid 30 years of learning uh, that uh, I think I can share some perspectives on the current situation. Um, and and uh, the journey has been fraught with ups and downs in terms of market. Uh, Satima, you asked me about the economic situation. Uh, I think I I can sort of, I would like to put it into a very simple way of things that we control and things we can perhaps influence but not control, right? So when you look at that, I'll give you some instances from my perspective in the journey that uh, uh, hopefully will shed some light on the relevance uh, to today's economic situation. Uh, so the 1990s, according to me, and I spent a major part of that career uh, abroad in the United States, uh, where uh, the industry uh, was uh, kind of at an inflection point, uh, coming from the 80s into a growth mode, uh, since specifically uh, capabilities around the internet in the mid 90s were coming up very, very quickly. Uh, and uh, uh, see, the online world was just taking into, into, into effect, uh, displacing the, not really displacing, but taking over from the old world of mail, uh, uh, in terms of marketing, um, outbound telemarketing, inbound telemarketing, et cetera, et cetera. And the channels uh, were being added on, right? Uh, so when you look at that, it contributed to a sort of a good uh, amount of uh, technology revolution aided by obviously good amount of hardware integration and spreading of computers globally at the consumer level, right? And then Intel came on with its uh, 386 into 486 and 586 and Pentium chips and the stories known right so computation increased storage uh, became uh, easier to access and uh, obviously internet came into being so when you look at that industry growth and i entered the industry uh, initially as an engineer in the uh, in a different in a manufacturing space but subsequently around the early 90s i entered the financial services industry and uh, when i entered the company I, the bank i worked for was a global bank right and uh, it was spread across multiple countries at that point coming off of uh, a uh, huge run in the consumer business that was under tremendous pressure because of the onset of new players that may not necessarily have been banks, but could have been monolines or could have been niche player. So I entered the card business and interestingly, the bank, which was about 20% of, uh, of the industry and the industry was growing at 20%, the bank was losing 20% share year, year over year. It was an interesting problem. Um, and uh, in hindsight, when I look at the learnings, uh, it created uh, a, a situation where the economic situation was good, but the business situation wasn't that good for certain players. Uh, and specifically, um, you know, the learning there was that a lot of the players looked at the market, at the cons consumer, uh, from the eyes of the product they had versus looking at themselves from the eyes of the customer, right? So uh, we understood that and we tried to turn that around and the way to do it at scale was to be able to get a good application and understanding of how, what the customers were doing. And um, uh, to do that at scale, we needed to, to put in a tremendous abilities to look at data, uh, data of the customers, uh, of our customers and customers that were not on us, that were doing things outside and how that sort of lens turned around and looked at us 
with with that behavior and therein came a sort of fundamental revolution at least in the financial services and consumer side of financial reengineering we called it at that point subsequently led to a variety of different roles and names uh, but the ability to be able to look at customer their behavior and then financially reengineer ourselves and products uh, and the industry as well subsequently the bank i was in and the, the business i was in saw tenfold growth uh, driven both by organic and inorganic over a period of seven years bringing it close to a fortune 35 company on its own right um, now you fast forward a little bit in the late 90s you look at the situation in which um, um, the world evolved right and they uh, actually 1999 was interesting uh, many of you may not uh, know uh, but there was something called y2k year 2000 The year 2000 was approaching so fast, right? And uh, uh, most of our old system on which utilities were run, etc., were all two-digit, two, two-digit systems. So if uh, the date turned to zero one, uh, it could have backtracked to 1901 instead of 2000. Um, you know, advent of 2000, and it could have uh, displaced the market significantly because systems could have shut down. So that was a huge thing in 1999. world came to virtual stop the midnight of 1999 on uh, december 31st right uh, it was interesting but all eyes were focused again things we could control right and things we could avert right uh, subsequently in 2001 as things evolved and uh, the dot com uh, sort of era came to an end you would have heard of dot com bust right economies had to be revived again right and therein came the low period of low credit growth right low credit availability low interest rate availability by credit uh, especially in the united states where the greenspan effect right and uh, uh, a huge chunk of monies were moved in the market and given out uh, to drive growth right again economic situation which we uh, could sort of control uh, in the short term long term effects were going to be only visible 8 or 10 years later and i'll talk that uh, out a little more right but 2001 there was an un, uh, unnatural event that occurred um, and it was man driven it was 911 and it kind of put a lot of things in perspective and the emotion there was a little bit more in terms of fear right uh, but again bounce back happened in a year two years and uh, the world recovered uh, subsequently uh, i think there were other natural uh, disasters that came in the sars uh, epidemic which i can sort of relate to today uh, the first version happened in 2003 right uh, but but the businesses were going on because these were localized instances right they were not sort of uh, what we call as pandemic across every right. country right um, and uh, around uh, as the low credit uh, low credit uh, huge credit but low interest rate environment drove growth right globally and uh, money's moved uh, very fast in the hands of consumers uh, there came in um, a huge uh, a uh, uh, crisis uh, actually in 2008 where wall street really sort of bottomed out right and uh, age old companies sort of went bankrupt uh, long story there uh, i think many of you already know the reasons for that uh, driven partly by the real estate market and by the, partly by the huge amount of bets on the derivative markets uh, but that really led to a fundamental way in which we had to relook at how we do our applications and how we do business right uh, and so so business understanding is extremely crucial because that's the juncture that i would say that most of our analytics modeling went out the door within an hour not within a month or a year not within a week but within an hour uh, the bank was i was uh, working for had run offs of 1 billion dollars of deposits a day right so no models which were based on pricing and elasticity could work right because the outliers became the norm so new normal at that point the outliers of the models right and the outlier could be for example not price Uh, but it could be a uh, safety a uh, security right um, and so the emotion there was security right uh, very different emotion uh, you fast forward a little bit another natural disaster hit uh, again a pandemic in 2012 called mers uh, in between there was man made disasters as well uh, but there was uh, uh, the world came to stop for 7 days when the iceland volcano happened i know i was stranded in egypt that time in london for 7 days no travel right so these situations make you learn a lot of different things as to what's happening you fast forward to 2020 now right um and you look at the situation that's occurred with covid 19 um i do think that this is a little different uh, the mortality rate may be much lower than the previous epidemics honestly 
But the fact is that the global interdependence driven by digitalization is so huge, right? And the supply chain markets are so dependent on each other, right? A breakage in one uh, will cause a ripple effect across others. So what do you think will happen when there's a breakage across the globe at the same time, right? The world stops. And so the economic upheaval that may be caused and the recovery for this may take a little bit of time, uh, much longer than perhaps we have experienced in the past. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's really important for, for people to be able to focus. Uh, and we can, start, we can talk a little bit more about this in the subsequent uh, dialogue uh, when we talk about the application of analytics to be able to uh, get through um, and using that experience to be able to help through such times for businesses as well as for individuals. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Rajiv. I think uh, this is a pretty uh, insightful uh, start and the way you laid uh, out the, the chronal in, you know, stops in a chronological order start, starting from 1990s where, uh, you know, moving from product centricity to customer centricity. Uh, then you know uh, having that feedback loop so that so that you know one gets better in the in the productization uh, through different uh, events that happened along the way right uh, and as you pointed out some of those are man made i myself uh, was in the thick of things in 2007 2000 uh, eight uh, when uh, when we kind of went through that financial crisis and the housing market mortgage was was uh, kind of known to be the culprit that was driving the show and I was kind of middle of the things uh, involved in in a lot of activities around that space now uh, as you as you pointed out it's uh, the difference is at that point in time many things are are man made you know the the financial uh, instruments or the institutions which, which started uh, crashing and there's a cascading effect uh, that that happened in 2008 and, and 9. Uh, but now the situation is different. Uh, as you pointed out, uh, we are so connected and interdependent on each other. And this phenomena is uh, is an act of God and uh, and it's uh, it's global, right? Now, uh, through this, one thing that is getting highlighted, and uh, for those who uh, who know you uh, closely, and I'm I being the one, uh, I I know the the value that you give to experience, right? And and for you, experience doesn't mean being there, but how you reflect and pick the dots and utilize that experience for. Uh, for optimizing the action in the future. So, uh, so I wanted you to, uh, for, for the participants here, I wanted uh, you to highlight and uh, give your perspectives on the thought behind uh, the experience that you, that you value. And how do you, how do you uh, bring in, in connect threads in to what we are trying to do in analytica in yeah. terms of uh, pro propelling the businesses through experience analytics and AI? Yeah. That's a, that's a good question, Satyamoy. Uh, I think we can, we can go on for quite some time. And, uh, but I'll tell you this, that uh, the, the uh, analytics is, in the end, it's not a tool, right? It's not, it's not a, a process also. Uh, analytics is, in my view, uh, an application. It's, it's a culture, right? It's, it's built on... Uh, uh, a thought process that enables you to move forward with uh, a calculated risk uh, and with the thought of mitigating the risk aspects, yes. right? Uh, and uh, the moment you turn it into a process or a tool, you lose uh, some of those dimensions, right? Uh, and so, so those are the intangible dimensions that come uh, from you being exposed to a variety of different situations. Uh, you being exposed to a variety of different uh, dimensions uh, that enable you to make the right decision. Analytics has to help you uh, converge, converge in a way that you make a calculated risk and make a decision that is more right uh, than perhaps on a random basis. That is more right than perhaps the wrong ones that may happen, right? So the question is, how do you converge continuously? Like I call it asymptotic convergence, mm -hmm. right? There's never an end point that you say, I've stopped, right? Uh, but you continuously make it better and better incrementally. So I'll give you one example, right? And uh, I think that will make things a little bit clearer um, in terms of how these softer dimensions come into impact, right? One thing I will tell you is that analytics and even Analytica, what is trying to do today is a very strong pro proponent of business integration uh, to what it's doing today. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Uh, um, I got the opportunity to learn right through these years. I was an engineer, 
I was an analyst, I was a CFO, uh, I, w- I worked roles in marketing risk, uh, uh, etc. Uh, and I got exposed and it was a great learning journey. I went to management as well. Um, and I got the exposure across 25 countries, right? 25 markets and portfolios there. Um, and one thing stood out that unless you understand the business, right? Uh, however, much your terms of your systems of Python or whether it's typical tools or algorithmic tools or data sciences, machine learning, AI, right? Your ability to be able to apply that, dissect that, right? And understand the problem and then create an approach to solve analytically and then communicate that back to the business is extremely crucial, right? So I tell you, 2007, you talked about, right? 2008, uh, you, you talked about that crisis and you said, uh, uh, you know, that a lot of us were actually present trying to figure things out at that point. Now, the science of this could actually, you could go back to the era of late 90s, early 2000s, right? And uh, the United States started putting in a lower interest rate environment to drive uh, growth, uh, as I said, to, to give credit out there, right? And that was driven by a situation because of the dot-com burst. They wanted the economy to be able to continuously go, right? And so when you have that situation going on years and years, and at some point, the real estate market also was quite strong in the United States, right? Year over year, it was going up more than 20%. Right? You have an extremely low interest rate environment, right? In a big able fuel economy uh, growth, and you have a strong real happen, right? At some point, the historical learnings are lost and the sort of the financial institutions are taking a leap of faith to be able to say this will go on for one or two more years and I will start giving credit at much lower, at better value propositions, right? So banks started giving credit to consumers, for example, at 100% or 120% the loan to value of their yeah. houses, right? So what did happen? What will happen if a, if a house price crashes even 10% mm-hmm. there, right? It's going to be a massive recall, a margin yeah. recall, and as well as ability for consumers if they can't pay a foreclosure. And so small correction in the market, they were highly leveraged, right? And then you built your derivative models on top of that, right? So, um, you know, in 2004, right, um, uh, when I was sort of working um, and has just come from uh, my CFO back into building an advanced analytical capability for this bank, uh, a business manager, right, came um, uh, and a CFO came to me and said, my balance sheet is bleeding. And this was on a credit card product, which is kind of an unsecured debt, unsecured lending, right? And my, my balance sheet is bleeding, help me. Now, if you give that to a data scientist of today, uh, the answer is probably going to be, okay, okay, help me understand what the problem is. I, I don't understand balance sheets, but if you're asking me to build a, 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 a let's say, a, a balance model or a response mm-hmm. model, I'll do it for you, right? Uh, there is a package where the problem needs to be under as to why this unsecured debt were bleeding, and then how do you sort of uh, uh, get an analytical right? Right. Yeah. What was happening was that the uh, the heavy um, uh, uh, low interest rate environment in the mortgage and then the HELOC, which is the home equity loan space, uh, started playing into effect at a very high real estate value, giving a lot of credit uh, uh, to the consumers in the hand of consumers. So the house was worth 120,000 and their uh, cost was only 80,000. They have a $40,000 uh, loan that was available immediately at their hands. And they took that and what happens is the high rate loan starts getting paid off, which is, so if there's a crisis, what do you pay off first? You pay off your unsecured debt. Yep. You pay off the high rate loans and those unsecured debt was being paid off, which is a credit card debt, mm-hmm. right? It happened not across the globe. It happened with the affluent customers in a very small segment, 0.5%, mm-hmm. right? Now, putting that and analyzing that and getting that was a needle in a stack, right? right. Understanding that in the first place was an analyst job. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a business job, right? And the business could only see the aggregates, right? And so I bring that uh, forth to be able to, uh, in this example, to show why it's crucial to be able to, it took us a year, mm-hmm. honestly, to get to that needle in a stack, yeah. right? Um, and a year and many, many people to be able to look at that and slicing and dicing across a huge portfolio of almost $150 billion in, in assets, right? So, uh, but that's what I'm trying to say that the business integration becomes extremely, extremely crucial 
and the experience to be able to work with through uh, uh, in a business situation is not just function of your tools or your techniques uh, or your algorithms or your programming languages. It's the ability to draw and extract that knowledge, work on it through your techniques, and then extract that knowledge back and put it back in the business. Right. Right. Yeah. So uh, it, it, it makes a lot of sense, uh, uh, Rajiv. Uh, and now I'm getting into the, the next segment of my set of questions. So as you suggested, uh, and as you, as, as you keep saying on and off that uh, analytics is, is perhaps the right blend of art and science. And uh, many people out there mistake it as a tool technique or a pure uh, science. But, but when, when situation changes, then science don't work, right? So one of my, uh, my, my mentors uh, used to say that, uh, you know, analytics is tougher than rocket science because rocket science follows a principle. You know, if you know the formula right, you know where to place the rocket and, and how. But, uh, we are actually dealing with human behavior, which keeps on changing and which is irrational as science want to work. Now, uh, I, think, I think one of the questions that I keep getting many times, I'm sure you do uh, as well, and I'm sure many of us present here uh, who are just starting their career or probably uh, students or young, young professionals. I think one thing that they will ask is, how do you get that experience, right? Unless you, unless you are there, unless you actually go through the situation, how do you get that experience? And if you don't get the experience, how do you apply yourself? So it's kind of what comes first. So how do you, how do you address that, uh, Rajiv, uh, when you say that application of experience is very, very important, uh, but in order to apply, you need to get that experience. So how do, you, how do we solve that? Is, yeah, what is the a, thought process? Chicken and egg, but I think there is, a, there is a way to be able to look at it and you replicate life's journey in a way that you can understand it very quickly uh, with the tools and technologies we have today, right? So you look at, uh, I look at my journey, right? And I look at um, the, the the times which I had to go and learn and relearn things uh, and unlearn as well, right? I, I had to unlearn many things. It's a tough thing to do, uh, but I had to be exposed and adapt to new normals and new situations. Um, and uh, that came through, obviously, a period of time, but that came through uh, the willingness to learn, but as well as the ability to apply myself to those learnings uh, into the business at those points in time. Now that is an expanded out multi-year journey, right? Um, but the the fact is that if you break that down and you say that you know many people, so today many people say that I learn from being told what to do, right? Uh, many people today say that I learn from being trained. So give me a classroom session, give me a homework, give me an assessment, instruct me. Uh, whether remotely or in closed walls, um, and then I will go and apply. The problem with that education system is very simple, that unless you do that stuff yourself, you will forget that, right? And probably as you exit that door, right, uh, of, of training, you will probably forget 50% at that point itself, at that doorway. And then another 50% probably end up applying only 5 to 10% of that, right? So the, the, the problem with that is that while it exposes you to certain things, uh, it doesn't make you experience that journey, right? right? And so uh, what we have been doing, um, and in my journey as well, I've, I've thought this through a number of times that I learned best. In fact, there is research which says 90% of your learning comes from doing, mm -hmm. right? And I said, why can't we replicate this multi-year journey and bring it to your fingertips in a few months, right? And uh, make it domain specific with your financial services, with your retail, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera, right? But contextualize it with an ability to keep the analytics learning back into the play to, to make business impact. And uh, we sort of have been experimenting with this. You have been part of the journey as well over the last seven years to bring that experience to life uh, uh, by doing a, a lot of innovation in the space and bringing it through simulations and other ways uh, virtually at your fingertips, right? And so to be able to bring forth an engine to you that can be molded in your domain to your specific requirements, right? Um, and that we can talk about ATH leaps and which you are going to hear subsequently, uh, but that's fundamental, that thought process into this whole learning, applying, going back to learning, applying, and then actually solving, right? Uh, without guidance, but going back to learning so that whole cycle becomes mm -hmm. seamless, right? Of learn, apply, and solve. Right, right. So yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I think I think uh, it it definitely uh, highlights right that there is a there's a gap out there in terms of how 
the education system or how the learning as such on the whole is being perceived so uh, so that that brings uh, perhaps you know the the, the next uh, question as to as to when we uh, when when you, you conceived uh, analytica treasure hunt as a platform right where where uh, and you you're a firm believer in in a, in a lifelong uh, learning kind of abilities and learning application and solutioning so how do you how do you see blending up all this together coming in place and what is the essence behind uh, the platform the ip that we have and what is the idea behind opening it up uh, outside now uh, so that you know we can kind of propel that kind of a thought process of learning application and solutioning so uh, i would say satyamoy that there are a few things uh, that are more important for this generation the coming few years that uh, will uh, that drive that thought process and that has driven me as well and uh, all of our team members to 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 put forth this platform called treasure and right um you see learning uh, applying and solving is no doubt a framework that we have created uh, but the basic intangibles that drive that framework is uh learning not just the hard skills right um uh, but it's very important to understand that you learn how to learn itself right. uh, versus learning an end point mm -hmm. with an end point in mind right when you learn with an end point in mind which is the hard skills uh like you learn python or you learn r or you learn uh, a tool or a technique you learn uh, machine learning or you learn uh how to build um you know uh, certain uh, products right these are end points in itself uh and as technology evolves newer tools newer languages become devel uh, they start developing you kind of run into a roadblock then you have to relearn right but if you learn how to learn quickly mm -hmm. right uh then you are continuously updating yourself because you are learning here your reflexes are being honed on right and True. that process was the one that i wanted to be able to instill a little bit into the creation of treasure hunt and tre i called it asymptotic convergence right there's no end point there right you are continuously iteratively doing more and more mm -hmm. but the ability it's like treasure hunt because it's the game of riddles right, right? you are trying to solve except that the treasure is a moving target and you're mm -hmm. continuously running behind it you can stop at any point and reap the rewards but you can probably do better and better uh, with uh, with a little bit more effort so to enable that uh, we had to figure out a way in which we compress and this is what you get through experience mm -hmm. and exposure over years to compress that into a very small sort of compressed uh, time frame and a virtual ability uh, to be able to bring in front of you and that's what right. that's why treasure hunt was born right mm -hmm. and that ability in, a, in our uh, boundary which is the ability to apply analytics to solve business problems right mm -hmm. contextually then came the thought that absolutely if i were to be able to expose that person then i also want them to be able to understand that the thought behind it is not just that i am dealing with a structured set of problems right, right. the ability to deal with the unstructured the ability to yep. deal with a little bit gray area so not, not always black and white that's mm -hmm. what you have to have business right yep. you have a problem the balance sheet is bleeding it's very gray now mm -hmm. you got to in a black and white and create an analytical problem out of it to be able to solve it right yes. that thought process also had to be brought into play through this whole journey mm -hmm. uh, to be able to make it come to life in a graded manner yes. so i see that as a journey was an end point yeah. and that also fueled this uh, this treasure and lastly i i tell you i tell you this that learning and training uh, and 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 solving um it requires a little bit of hand holding but requires a lot of self motivation mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. uh, it requires a lot of willingness yes. and ability as things change you have to be able to adapt and take yourself to that yeah. aspect mm -hmm. right um, and so no tool no technique no process will get you there because as you said um, it's not a rocket science mm -hmm. that i have a formula i can do that yeah. uh, a lot of it rests here and your motivation is extremely important which will which will be the winning factor in terms of these things so we are enablers the end point is you right? yes yeah 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 so yeah i th i think i think that's that's very important uh, for everybody to understand that uh, that what is the the one skill that's going to be sought after lifelong is how do you apply yourself in first principle how do you quickly uh, learn new new stuffs and move on 
and not uh, carry something which can probably act as a baggage for you, given uh, in the dynamic world today and and all the more it's going to change, right? So, uh, so I think one of the essence of the of our our IP and that's where we have our design patent on uh, in the innovation in the education space is how do you actually enable somebody to learn better, faster, and apply themselves quickly. And that is where perhaps the, we, are, we are solving or, or kind of uh, scratching the surface and solving the problem of, of ability to not being there as uh, may not be, be uh, no longer a gap in terms of absence of experience right so if we if we solve for that then we are actually offering somebody to continue to be in a continuous learning path and apply themselves to be future ready right mm -hmm. so that comes to the last question and i think we can go and on on and on uh, rajiv you touched uh, quite a few things right you painted a picture in terms of uh, the how your journey has been how you reflected on how you applied yourself how you coined analytical resident uh, and and how do we how are we kind of uh, poised today to take it uh, out there for everybody to come and experience right so uh, so one one last uh, question and then i'll kind of open it up for for everybody to get a chance to to ask uh, questions to you uh, is to is to given all this right and given we are in, a, in an uncertain time and uh, as you know things are changing uh, by the day and hopefully things will become normal soon but is the normal is the is the definition of normal going to be changed? change. Uh, what does somebody who is just entering the professional space or who are in their in their uh, mid, mid of their career, what is that they need to expect? What is that need, they need to be prepared for uh, to strive through this journey and, uh, and, and be positive and strive their careers towards the right direction? Right. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> uh, I wish I had a mentor who would have given me the answer for that as well in my journey, right? So, yeah. Uh, I can only help uh, talk from my experiences and I'm sure there's many others who have uh, good points of view here as well. Uh, my learning tells me a couple of things, right? Uh, that as we are poised uh, in this situation today in the market, right? And it's not a, a usual market condition today as we expect, uh, as we see uh, from our historical curves, right? Even analytics fails here, right? To a large extent uh, because it's a natural event. Uh, but, and also because the line of sight is only a function of as far, as fast as human beings can sort of bounce back uh, with certain sort of uh, uh, cures that they may sort of have for such an event, right? Uh, and that is still an uncertain, uh, uncertain event. Uh, we don't have line of sight for that, which means that the recovery uh, will probably take a little bit more time uh, than perhaps uh, we expect uh, because there is no end in sight for the current uh, event, uh, the, the businesses and uh, the economic situations that may cause that upheaval may have a hard time. Some of them may never come back. Now, some of the industries may not come back, right? Um, and so that will almost define a new normal uh, in that sense uh, as to what that is. Now, when you, when you think closer to our space of analytics and applied analytics and uh, 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 artificial intelligence as well, and now this has been going on the last five, seven years at a tremendous pace, right? right. Uh, Ten years ago, you wouldn't have thought of Tesla coming out with a self-driving car um, or, uh, you know, a, a massive, uh, you look at the markets right now, uh, you have the traditional uh, sort of mar uh, auto companies really struggling to keep up, uh, whereas a company like Tesla is doing extremely well. Um, now, the question is, uh, where is it headed, right? Um, and, and how do you think, uh, this is going to occur for, uh, let's say, our space, uh, which is data science and applied analytics. Uh, my view is, is very simple. I stick back to the three things I mentioned earlier, right? That technology will continue to outpace uh, the ability uh, for us to be able to uh, do the same thing that we used to do in, in, in a manner that will be very, very different, right? Um, and so uh, this is a, a challenge for many human beings, but uh, I see it as an opportunity because the opportunity is the fact that you can do things that you couldn't do before. The thought process, the critical thought process. Uh, let technology take, you, take over all the automation stuff, right? Don't worry about all that, right? So what's important for you is to be able to unlearn certain things mm -hmm. and not bias yourself. Right. And then to be able to ensure that you're prepared to learn new things continuously, right? Um, and the ability to learn is more important than the learning itself, right? Um, and secondly, I will say that uh, 
the volatility in the economy is high, right? And, uh, you know, it's not like you can go through economic curves of the traditional 10-year curves or seven-year curves. Now, every two, three years, as technology revolution propels it, you have to be prepared to be able to deal with things that you have not experienced before, right? And so exposing yourself to those situations more and more where it's, it's uncomfortable, right? Exposing yourself to discomfort is extremely important, right? right? But take risks, take calculated risks, leverage the power of your capabilities to take those calculated risks, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you will fail, but over time, the 80-20 rule holds and you will make the right decisions very, very speedily, right? Lastly, I would say that, um, you know, this is an exciting world that we are coming into. It is an extremely positive way to be able to look at opportunities would become extremely challenging, right? If you don't have the willingness or the motivation or the mindset to be able to adapt to it, right? Be hungry, right? Uh, Steve Jobs mm -hmm. said, stay hungry, stay foolish. I, I, I why with that, right? I really believe in that. And it's your opportunity right now to be able to differentiate yourself amongst the others. Great. Uh, thank you, Rajiv. So it has been uh, wonderful. I'm sure 30 minutes cannot do justice to, to all that uh, you have to uh, share and, and talk about, but uh, I'm sure we'll, uh, everybody will get more opportunities for to be part of this kind of discussions. So with that, uh, I will uh, pause here, I'll end here, uh, and I will open it up for, uh, for questions and interactions. And uh, if uh, some of you don't get an opportunity to ask a question to Rajiv uh, because of the time constraint, uh, please feel free to reach out uh, to him directly or any of us in Analytica and, and we'll make sure that uh, you get a response. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Satyamoy. Thanks, uh, thanks all of you, looking forward. Uh, so the title of our next section, uh, that is Common Sense in AI, is uh, pretty uh, trivial as well as interesting at the same time. So Common Sense in Natural Language Processing. So NLP, as you know, uh, is one of the most interesting frontier of machine learning and AI at this time. Today, we have multiple algorithms to identify a hidden sentiment group of, uh, group of words or to extract information from a text. However, these algorithms are not attuned for business context every time and uh, where they are being applied, which creates a gap between a business problem and the analytical solution. So in this session, uh, we will explore a bit more about how we can bridge this gap. And joining on, uh, us on this is the Vice President of Client Solutions and Product Strategy at Analytica Data Labs, Madhav Kaushik. Hi, Madhav. Hey Varun, uh, thank you for the quick intro. Uh, so, are so, you able to see my screen? Yeah. So, just an intro to Madhav. Uh, Madhav has more than a decade of experience in analytics and data science across different industry, with domain expertise in banking and financial services. He was uh, recently recognized as a leading data scientist and the young leader, as well as the part of the group awarded 40 under 40 data scientist of India by Analytics India magazine. So welcome, Madhav. Thanks again, Varun. Thank you for the kind words. Uh, so as I'm just setting this up, uh, just bear with me. Uh, I'll just confirm with Varun, if you're able to see my screen, I am just sharing a presentation. Yes, you can see the presentation. OK, great. So then uh, we'll get started. Uh, Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening, early good morning. Uh, as I heard Satyamoy saying that, you know, we have, we have folks uh, across the globe. Uh, so today, uh, as Varun mentioned, I'll be uh, kind of uh, talking about uh, three concepts, common sense knowledge, uh, AI solutions, and business impact. And uh, to bring these concepts together, I'll take an example of an advanced NLP solution uh, that we had developed and successfully implemented uh, in a healthcare domain for one of our clients. Uh, before we jump in though, I would like to, uh, you know, highlight the significant contributions of uh, two distinct individuals uh, for in, in, in the fields of common sense knowledge and AI. Uh, the first being uh, Scott Adams for his uh, continued contribution towards common sense knowledge via his series Stillbirth. Uh, I'm an avid follower. And as you see here, uh, Dilbert and Wally are interacting with the robot. 
And clearly there seems to be a different of perspective between uh, Dilbert, Wally and the robot. Uh, I think we are all are getting into, uh, you know, we have all seen cartoons uh, in terms of uh, machine learning and how machines learn and how it can go all right and wrong. Uh, but I think uh, Scott Adams has always been a pioneer and frontier in terms of articulating these aspects. Uh, second, I would like to call out, you know, the contributions of uh, Alan Turing. Uh, Alan, who is considered uh, the father of AI uh, for his uh, work in terms of machine learning, uh, explaining AI uh, in terms of, you know, even designing the Turing test where he is recognized as the father of uh, theoretical computer science. And uh, the Turing test basically talks uh, about the ability of a machine to exhibit int intelligent behavior, uh, which is almost indistinguishable, uh, you know, of that of a person or, or a human. So, uh, with that, uh, you know, given that you're focusing on uh, AI and common sense knowledge. So in the sphere of AI research, uh, we don't have common sense, but we have common sense knowledge. So what exactly is common sense knowledge? Uh, so common sense knowledge, uh, you know, in the sphere of AI research also means, uh, you know, things that uh, one would, one should know in terms of, you know, which are common in terms of uh, consists of the facts of everyday world, like lemons are sour, uh, that, are, that all humans would know, uh, you know, lemons are sour, deposit your money in a bank. So taking that example of uh, depositing, depositing your money in a bank, uh, when we start talking about, you know, a bank deposit, so these two words, uh, what is it that uh, comes to your mind? So for example, the first thought that comes to mind is a financial institution where, you know, the process is that you are going to deposit your money or your uh, precious gems, jewelry, uh, with the idea that you know you can take it out whenever you want. So now, if I bring on the second picture uh, on the screen, so you will see that uh, a bank deposit in this picture, uh, the meaning of it completely changes. Uh, here, the bank deposit means the deposits of sand, rich in minerals on the bank of a river, and even the process of a bank deposit changes where here we are actually not depositing but the process associated with these words would be where you are actually taking out these deposits from the sand and you might actually sell those out for money. And uh, similarly, if I were to uh, take this example of the third picture, which is uh, bags of blood, uh, here now the focus is uh, again on the two words bank deposit, uh, where my process and the meaning and context of these two words changes completely. Uh, the process here is that you're actually giving away your blood to a bank for a deposit uh, with the expectation uh, that you know it will go to your loved one or for a social cause. Uh, and most likely you'll never be receiving that the same thing back again, uh, your own blood, I mean. So from the point of this example being that the same set of words can have a completely different set of process, uh, you know, meanings, uh, processes associated with them, perspectives, and even experiences. And uh, even though they are the same two words, uh, the context uh, behind each of those can be very, very different. Hence, uh, you know, today when we start talking about application of AI solution in a business domain, so this contextualization of common sense knowledge, uh, which is basically knowledge of the business domain, uh, becomes extremely important. It's very, very significant. Uh, so the said. Uh, in other words, contextualization of the information to make business sense is what it means to have incorporation of this common sense knowledge in this AI solutions. And as you can see from these above examples, uh, if these two words were to be taken out in a different context in these different three different business scenarios, be it a mining of a river bank, a healthcare industry or a financial institution, uh, they can give very, very different examples and they can come up with very, very different insights uh, which can only make sense if they are being applied in the right business domain and with the right contextualization. With that, uh, what I would like to do is uh, take you through uh, one of the examples that I have mentioned how we can bring together this overall concept of contextualization uh, in AI through one of the NLP solutions that we had built. So uh, here, what we will do is, uh, we have been working uh, as one of our clients, we've been working with the uh, US-based healthcare provider who are responsible uh, where, the, where the problem that they're trying to solve is that they want to uh, identify priority stubs uh, out of all the stubs that are raised. And these priority stubs need to be reported to a regulatory body 
within seven days of the stub race date. Now, uh, to achieve this objective, the business wanted to leverage the power of AI uh, and you know to build like an NLP solution so that they are able to mitigate the risk and optimize their business actions. Uh, given the domain, the risk to the business here is many fold. Uh, you know, the primary risk here being a patient safety. So a stub is categorized as a priority stub if it can lead to a patient safety issue. And uh, a stub can also be, uh, you know, in terms of uh, how to visualize a stub, basically a ticket, for example, being raised as part, part of a process. So when you're trying to identify a ticket, which can actually lead to a patient safety issue that can have a critical impact, not just on the business in itself, which is the healthcare provider here, but also on the patient and uh, it can have multifold uh, you know issues in terms of not just that uh, you the healthcare provider can lose trust uh, very quickly uh, if there is uh, issues with the patient safety uh, you know i'm sure that like, uh, none of the patients or around the community uh, would be willing to go to that healthcare provider so these are two examples that we have listed out in terms of, you know, what would be as a, what can be associated with as a priority stub versus a non-priority stub. So for example, uh, a little bit of description in terms of what is the data that we'll be able to collect from a priority stub is, so we had the heading, which is being filled out uh, by the uh, people working at the healthcare provider. Uh, it can be nurses or any other admin people, uh, employees. So which will be kind of filling out the subject, which is predominantly in free flow handwriting. Uh, along with the some description of the stuff. So for example, on the left, uh, what I see is, uh, you know, urgent having trouble sending out medication list to the pharmacy. Uh, all medications sent are being are pending status. Now here the issue is that whatever uh, pharmacy lists that are being generated that that are needed, uh, there is some breakage in the process. They are being held out somewhere. The pharmacy is not getting the list, so they are not able to release those. Uh, items. Uh, now, if somebody is in a critical care, uh, you know, can be very relevant to the current scenario we all are in. Uh, if you need some of these uh, emergency equipment and uh, there is a breakage just because of a process, now this can lead to a big, uh, big issue from patient safety perspective. You'll not get the right pharmacy or the medicine or the equipment. And, you know, uh, the patient who is, let's say, is being treated uh, in a critical care. Uh, that, that few seconds uh, can actually be a make or break. So definitely this is a priority issue. Uh, so the stub being raised here needs to be dealt immediately. And even before being dealt, you know, it needs to be categorized that it's a priority so that it can be dealt pretty quickly. Uh, so on the right, what we see is again, an example of a stub that is being raised. So we have the subject line and then we have the description. Now here the description and subject uh, again, looks pretty urgent. Uh, we are talking about, you know, data coming out from a healthcare domain. So everything is urgent. But again, between all those urgencies, you know, how do we define what is priority? So here you see that, you know, the somebody has kind of logged in that they have been logged out of the system. I need a password reset urgently. Uh, these uh, issues usually arise from different nursing stations, which are used for uh, future scheduling. Now here, uh, that context kind of, you know, provides the ability for us to say, okay, although it looks very urgent, somebody might be needing it right now. But at the same time, we know from the contextualization of this uh, of this data coming from the back end, where this stuff can be raised or these issues tend to occur, we know this uh, does not really lead to a patient safety issue and hence is a non, not priority stuff. So uh, having classified the two, uh, we'll kind of move forward as to what we did in terms of building out a solution, uh, an advanced NLP solution to say, what are these, uh, how can we predict which ones of these stubs are priority stubs, then which can be, you know, quickly taken up for resolution and also being shared with the regulatory body. So as part of building out an NLP solution, uh, we uh, followed the process, which is kind of uh, laid out. So we started with the, our overall uh, data gathering exercise. We are building a corpus of all the data available from the priority stubs, uh, from all the stubs available. And here, the first piece was to make sure that we are actually analyzing the right data. So we only wanted to take data into consideration, which is coming from the subject line, which is coming from the description, and to remove any data set or any data that's available in these tubs, you know, which can be again in the text format, but is not relevant to our analysis or the objective. Uh, for example, you can have a lot of TNCs conditions, some operator numbers, IDs, uh, 
details laid out as part of their contract. Uh, so these are also uh, available in text, but uh, if we were to incorporate all that data, that would really basically dilute the data that we have in terms of focusing on our objective. So we had to make sure that we are building a corpus of the right data, which was based on the, as I said, the subject and the details provided. Once we had that, uh, we did a basic level of analysis on the gathered corpus, like frequency of count of total number of words, identifying special characters, stop words, et cetera. And from there is the next step, we started with some basic pre-processing, uh, like case correction, uh, making everything to a lowercase, uh, stop word removal, stemming, and tokenization. This was followed by some advanced pre-processing, which included n-gram generation, where we, for this specific analysis, we went up to three n-grams, and then followed by a TFID generation. Now that our data is ready, uh, the idea was to start applying some models uh, to see uh, which can be a good fit. And for that, uh, we first started out uh, with the naive-based classification algorithm. And as you see, we are getting uh, an accuracy of almost uh, 80%, where we are able to classify 80% of the priority stubs as priority stubs, which is, which is a pretty good start. And then we tried some further iterations. We kind of built about 4,000 trees uh, from a random forest, applying a random forest algorithm. And we are able to push this overall classification accuracy to 95%. So we are able to identify or classify 95% of the stubs, of the priority stubs as priority stubs, uh, which is, I would say, is a pretty good result and a result which also held in terms of our test and learn framework. So when we build the model and then we kind of test it out again on the holdout sample, uh, the accuracy only kind of dropped to about 92, 93%. Uh, so which is a very, very good result. But uh, now again, coming back in terms of the context of this uh, problem, right? The objective here is that we need to identify if there can be a ticket raised, which can lead to patient safety. So even though we are achieving a very good result of 95%, where we are able to identify this off this, and for this, we are leveraging 60% of the population, which is majority of the population, we are still going to miss 5% of the stubs, which are priority, which will be classified as not priority. Now that means that there can be 5% of issues that can trickle down from this algorithm and can lead to patient safety, which is a big no-go, which is again, as good as saying that, you know, I'm able to classify 50% of the stubs and 50% I have to find another way to make sure that I don't miss any because every single patient life is important. Uh, so we went back to the business uh, with these hypotheses, with these results and business had the same uh, questions to us that, you know, this is really good, but then how do we kind of push the limits to here? We are really looking towards 100% accuracy here. Now to build this out, uh, we kind of went back to the drawing board to understand, okay, what all data we have. Uh, until now, we have been using a lot of, uh, you know, good algorithms, which, which are uh, popularly used in the industry. Uh, and we have been able to gain good efficiency in terms of, you know, increasing our accuracy, uh, leveraging different types of algorithms as well. But can we do something differently here? So then we kind of came back. So we have a data for the healthcare provider for the last 10 years. Uh, for all these stops being raised out across different time periods. Uh, so we had more than a million records of data available. So we said, you know, why not first we train our data to make sure that we have the right contextualization happening from there. So we are able to pick the right words for based on which we want to predict and build our uh, objective function so that we are building our NLP uh, solution on those objectives. And for that, we uh, researched and we found that one of the algorithms being used there uh, is uh, Google's word to work, which can help us to sort of contextualize our data based on, you know, what our objectives are. So we went back to the board where we said, okay, now the first point is that we need to contextualize our data. So we started with our overall built corpus. Uh, we took all the 1 million uh, data points that we had uh, spanning across last 10 years, which also gave us much more data in terms of not just training uh, the Google's word to work algorithm on our data set, but also making sure that we are capturing a lot of variability in the data over the past years as well. And then we kind of went through the same process of information retrieval, basic pre-processing, cleaning out the data. And in terms of the advanced pre-processing, uh, that's where we apply the Google word to work algorithm using a single layer neural network. And once we were able to apply that, and then we applied a multi-layer perceptron model to have the final model being applied on the new data set that was available, which was 
contextualized based on the objective, we were able to achieve an accuracy of 99.7%. Now this is almost close to 100% and the business feels pretty good about it in terms of uh, you know, testing it out, having to make sure that the algorithm that we are running, the solution that is being implemented at their end is able to get them almost 100% of the accuracy needed from a classification perspective. And uh, so this solution that was built uh, over a couple of months of time was built uh, by Analytica uh, through our internal team of experts and data scientists uh, on our patent platforms. And uh, then we were able to kind of implement this for the business and they're pretty happy. Uh, but we felt that, you know, we are at 99.7%. Can we take it to 100%? So, you know, we again striving for better. So from there now, uh, Google has moved from word to work to bird. So we thought, why can't we? So we are in the process of uh, building that out and, you know, building prototypes where we can go beyond 99.7% and have a much more robust and strong algorithms, uh, which can then be leveraged to, uh, you know, build uh, very specific and sophisticated solutions, uh, which are very, very relevant in today's space as well. Now, as we're talking about in terms of, you know, uh, as part of the process, uh, what I would want to highlight is that uh, this is something that, you know, uh, that somebody did not really give us this approach. Uh, as part of this overall learning, we had the machines available to us. Uh, we had a lot of information available to us in-house, outside. So it's, it's a continuous learning. So in, in our last discussion also, we did talk a lot about, right, that it has to be about continuous learning, trying to understand from your data, trying to see where we need to be headed, being very, very closely tied to your objectives that you're trying to reach. And uh, so what we have tried to do here is that uh, with this today's event around the launch of our Leafs platform, uh, we are trying to bring some aspects of these different uh, you know, business offerings that we have from a platform perspective, which are today where we are integrated with some of the big businesses across India and US, we are kind of bringing out and opening up uh, so that you know, everybody can uh, start taking on the journey in terms of you, how do you start building about that process that you are being very, very objective, uh, you are very focused in terms of you know, what the business requirements are, uh, you are able to contextualize those requirements as you're not trying to build uh, those solutions uh, from an analytical or a machine learning perspective. And we are not just applying, trying to apply algorithms, right? Because uh, today we do hear a lot about that, you know, we can start applying very fancy algorithms, but it's at the end, it's all about generating that impact. Uh, it's all tied back to the contextualized, to the business problem. Is it being developed for the right uh, domain? Is the objective clearly defined? And with that, you know, how we can start leveraging some of these aspects uh, uh, as part of uh, the next session or the next uh, phase of my talk, uh, I will kind of, you know, walk us through the Leaps platform, what are the different aspects that you can start leveraging on the platform itself. Uh, we have a different slew of algorithms which can be picked up from there. But then once you apply an algorithm, how you make sense of it, how you apply it to the business scenario, how you apply in the right uh, domain, you know, with the right constraints, and then you create value. So we'll uh, kind of, you know, switch gears a little bit, uh, jump onto the Leaps platform, uh, have a quick walk through how we can, you know, get ourselves a little bit uh, handy and start running there. And then I'll pause for questions. Varun, does that sound good? Yeah, Madhav, it sounds perfect. Okay, so I'll just stop sharing my screen. And so I have logged into my Leaps platform. Uh, so the platform is at leaps.analytica.com. And uh, I have already signed in. Uh, anybody should be able to, once you're on, on the portal page, you should be able to uh, log in pretty quickly with your email ID. Uh, it's free. Uh, you can get started in no time. And as you are on the platform, I can give you a quick overview. So we have uh, different aspects that we have tried to bring together from our past learnings, like Rajiv and Satyam also mentioned that, you know, uh, we have tried to bring the experience, what we have been hearing from the industry. Uh, we have we are partnered with some of the big names in India and US. Uh, what we are doing for them, how can we bring that you know out here so that uh, everybody can start experiencing what we have? Uh, so you know you'll see you'll start seeing certain aspects of learn, apply, solve. So this is uh, the framework uh, where we have tried to build everything together and uh, learn, apply, solve together helps us to bring up to leaps. So learns us. So we have a lot of applied courses available today on Leaps, uh, you know, which again are free for somebody to just dive in, start focusing on what their journey is, where do you want to start. Uh, we have some 
uh, basic level courses, you know, which uh, shouldn't take you more than uh, 20 to 30 hours to kind of focus on from a dedicated effort perspective. Uh, we have some advanced level courses as well that you can start focusing on. Uh, then we have a slew of different, uh, what we call as cases. Now, uh, I think Satyam kind of alluded to these a little bit. Uh, here, what you'll start seeing is across different industry domains, uh, what we have put together is uh, different cases which start talking about, you know, application of some of the complex or simple uh, machine learning algorithms and different uh, spheres, you know, for example, NLP, uh, healthcare classification uh, or prediction problems, and then uh, how these can be applied in different industry domains for solving different industry problems. For example, uh, one of the very, I would say robustly used techniques or commonly used techniques is uh, logistic regression. Uh, very, very popular classification technique. Now, how it is deployed from a marketing scenario versus a risk scenario uh, has its own nuances. So a lot of these cases will help you to go through how different techniques you know, can be applied uh, to these different scenarios. Uh, we have examples of some of the most upcoming cases and from an IoT perspective, how, how can you uh, get familiar with data coming out from different IoT devices and start interpreting and analyzing that to recognize human activity. So you, we have seen examples, right? That you have trackers, you have watches, our smartphones. Uh, they are capturing a lot of the activity that we are doing. We are walking. You can see the steps that you walked in a day on your smartphone without really switching it on that device. Uh, so, you know, how, how are they kind of capturing it? When, when they try to uh, get the data out, uh, how is the data, how does that data look? So you can start uh, dwelling into these, focusing into these uh, uh, from uh, that perspective. I think uh, I'm not sharing my screen. Hey, so are you able to see my screen now? Yes, mother. Okay, sorry about that. So again, uh, as I was saying, so you know, uh, there's a slew of uh, different Mara, cases. just a, uh, yes. Sorry, just a pause. So uh, for our participants there, I hope uh, that you have registered on the Leaps platform. Uh, so what Madhav uh, is showing you is basically you can uh, go through once you have registered. So on the Leaps platform, you can, uh, when scrolling down, you can have that option. So Madhav is logged in, but on the top right corner, you can find uh, your section to uh, log in. And from there, after signing up, you can uh, go through all the cases and the, uh, other courses that mother uh, you know will be explaining thank you varun sorry about that so uh, okay so picking up from where we were so i think what we can do is uh, hoping that uh, all of you or at least some of you have logged in uh, if you have not you know uh, it's all free just log in to leaps.analytica.com and from there we can get started uh, we have some hackathons which will be coming up pretty soon uh, we already have a series of webinars uh, that are already in place, so that will be uh, that will be rolling out from today onwards. And I'll, for I would say to get the maximum out of them, it would be best to have uh, yourself logged in the Leaps platform. We'll be taking you uh, through you know different hands-on cases uh, as to how it can be applied, uh, not just from a Leaps perspective, in, but in terms of you know getting the right exposure to the data. How do you start thinking about the problem? What is the framework that you want to focus on? Uh, so it will be a very comprehensive uh, session that are coming up, which are scheduled on a weekly basis. Uh, we have a few blogs that you can go through. Uh, there are podcasts with uh, some of the industry leaders. Uh, you'll be able to hear a lot more from Rajiv and Satyamoy here as well. So uh, pretty good portal to be part of uh, as well, uh, as I think uh, Satyamoy mentioned. So we do have this uh, COVID analysis where we kind of updating this on a daily basis to see uh, you know, how uh, it's being tracked. Uh, the analysis kind of being tracked uh, and the response from different countries, how the situation is. And this is actually completely built in leaps. So you can actually try your hands out. Uh, you have these data sets available uh, out there in the open source. So you should be able to kind of, you know, uh, get to the data available. Uh, and let's say if you have this data available and you want to kind of start building something on yourself, uh, I can quickly walk you through the process in terms of how to do that. So, in apply once you're there, uh, you can actually go to my cases. So actually we can, you know, let's let's go ahead and create a case. So we can just create a case, uh, say, a demo case for,
and you can select the category just in the interest of time. So I will be kind of uh, brought into uh, the case and uh, feel free to upload any data sets that you might have. Uh, it allows for that. Uh, otherwise, there's a slew of data sets available to you across different domains, you know, that you can uh, just quickly pick up. Uh, I'll just take, you know, a quick category and say, okay, let me just take some customer complaints data. We've been talking about some NLP solutions. And as you, uh, as you can see, so once uh, it'll, it'll take a bit of time to uh, get your data uploaded here and uh, by the time your data is getting uploaded, you can see the different features available uh, on the screen. So for example, let me see. So you have different aspects of the data available to you. Uh, you can actually upload any data set that you might have. And uh, once you have available, uh, the data is available to you, you can actually start uh, working through the same. So on the left-hand side that you will see is, uh, so you have the data available to you. Uh, on the left-hand side that you are able to see the different, uh, so we, as uh, mentioned earlier, so we have more than 600 plus algorithms available to you, uh, available to anyone actually, uh, you know, in terms of uh, being able to leverage this out across different uh, function families. Uh, starting from your data management, data mining, uh, aspects of visualization, which has a complete suite of, uh, you know, interactive and static functions available uh, across different types of visualizations, uh, maths and stats, a very, very robust uh, family for uh, machine learning, which encompasses regression, classification, uh, clustering, uh, ability to even apply some of these models, you know, as you're kind of building out different model objects, uh, and then complete suite of time series analysis, uh, as well as text analytics. So, you know, as you're kind of uh, going through some of these uh, NLP problems as to how they can be built, so you can actually start leveraging a lot of these uh, available algorithms to start building up your case. Uh, I can take you a quick example as to how to do that. Uh, very, very simplistic format. Uh, whatever data that you have, you can just click here or, you know, you will be able to kind of click it out available from the table section. Uh, I have selected the column that I want to run on. Uh, let me start by building a corpus. Uh, for every algorithm that you're trying to run, you will have a description available. So you can actually go through this, understand what are your input requirements, uh, you know, how the output will be and how to take inference from those. Uh, in this case, I'm just trying to build a big corpus, so I'll not give any separators. Uh, I can execute. And in a click of a button, we'll be able to uh, execute our functions. And so we have our results available. As in the, even in the results section, uh, you can see that, you know, you have different aspects of uh, trying to have a deep understanding of what the codes are, uh, how the, those can be leveraged. Uh, you can plug in your notes. You can actually pin any of these results that you have. And what it does is uh, pinning anything here uh, will give you, uh, will take these to the dashboards. Uh, where you can actually take them up and uh, build out your own dashboard, like the COVID dashboard that I was showing to you, uh, which can be easily shared. You know, you can plan to share this on your social media. You can share it with your friends, your family. Uh, if you're leveraging this for doing some analysis that you want to build, you can actually uh, do that as well and share those links. Uh, so again, uh, from an execution perspective, uh, it's very, very simple. I would uh, definitely encourage everyone to uh, go through it, start, uh, bring some of your data sets, start building some analysis, uh, you know, take reference from the different courses available uh, on the Leaps platform. Uh, you have a lot of information and guidance available from different uh, cases as well across domains. And uh, in case, you know, you have any questions, uh, do feel free to reach out to us, uh, we'd be happy to help. So, uh, so with that, I'll take a pause and uh, see if there are any questions uh, from anyone. Sure. Thanks, Madhav, for that. Um, so I'd like to open the forum for any questions. So feel free to uh, post out your questions, comments uh, in the feedback section or ask a question section. And uh, we'll be streaming them to uh, Madhav. Uh, 
So in the meantime, Madhav, uh, we got some questions, uh, both on leaps as well as on your presentation before on uh, NLP. So I think I'll start from there. Uh, <clears throat> So in the, your presentation, you mentioned that uh, you were able to attain almost 100% of accuracy while using word to vec algorithm. So do you think that while using this algorithm, it will ascertain that we should be always be getting close to 100% algorithm, 100% accuracy? Uh, I would say uh, not, a, not a certain, but again, uh, you know, as uh, Rajiv and Satyam also mentioned, right? So uh, while you're trying to implement certain, uh, while you're trying to solve for certain objectives uh, and not just from an LNP uh, perspective, but in the wide sphere of machine learning or developing analytical solutions, uh, you have to focus on the approach. Uh, in this scenario, uh, word to vec uh, kind of got us the result that we were looking for, but it's not just that, you know, we applied word to vec and we were able to get 100%. Uh, once we were able to apply the word to vec we again had to go through a lot of data cleansing exercises, uh, build out, uh, ap apply a neural network or multi perceptron model on that to make sure that, you know, whatever we are building, uh, we are able to kind of uh, get that accuracy. And then once we had those results, we had to actually divide that based on the probability deciles that we got. So for some of the top deciles, we were, we continued to hold the probabilities that we were getting from the neural network. Uh, but for some of the lower deciles to make sure that, you know, we, we are able to get the highest available accuracy. We took a combination of different algorithms like uh, the multi-layer perceptron or the random forest. So whichever gave a higher probability, we kind of, you know, ingested that. So you, uh, again, you know, you have to keep learning even as you kind of following an approach. Uh, you have to be very, uh, very, very uh, open about, you know, applying what you're seeing. Uh, so that you are kind of, as you're kind of going through the objective, uh, you should be very, very clear that, you know, what your domain is, are you still contextualizing a problem to that specific domain? And uh, then based on, you know, uh, how far you want to go and, uh, you know, bring all the parties, the business, or, you know, if you're doing some research, making sure that everybody aligns that, you know, where we are is, is uh, the right result. Okay, fair enough. Uh <clears throat> so another question that comes in is uh, do you consider that con contextualization of is the one of the biggest challenge in NLP and along with context uh, contextualization uh, what do you think are the major challenges that AI or NLP especially faces uh, today sure uh, contextualization uh, definitely is one of the big challenges, uh, right? And I would say uh, not just from an NLP solution perspective, uh, but again, uh, you know, going back to the point that whatever solution that you're trying to build out uh, in the analytical space, uh, any data-driven data solutions, they have to be very, very clearly aligned to an objective. Uh, today, we are in a scenario where we have lots and lots of data available. Uh, you know, we are generating data, uh, like terabytes of data every second. Now, in order to make sense of the data, if we start leveraging all the data available to us, it's like boiling an ocean and we'll not be able to find the right objective or the solution that we're looking for. Uh, so it's always uh, a very good approach that you are able to contextualize what your objective is and contextualization uh, is not only focused on your objectives, uh, but also what your business domains are. Again, taking the example in terms of, you know, the, the two words of a bank deposit, can have may varied meanings based on the business problem and the business domain you're trying to solve for. Uh, speaks for itself that, you know, especially in an LP scenario, uh, you are trying to get, you're trying to create mathematical solutions based on the text that you have. So you better align that text based on, you know, what your business is. Otherwise, you don't want to be applying uh, extraction of a deposit from a blood bank that could have, you know, very varied results and might not be good in a scenario as well. Yeah. Thanks, Madhav. Uh, so we have another question coming in. Uh, it says that when starting out on leaps, uh, do I have to have any prerequisite in terms of coding knowledge or do I have to uh, have any prior statistical knowledge? Can a person like who is completely like a blank slate and no experience, uh, how can he learn or uh, leverage the leaps platform? Sure, I think uh... A very valid question. I think data science uh, has been, I would say, 
among the top jobs uh, for the last few years. Uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, have been wanting to kind of switch careers or at least start their careers in data science. So when you're kind of starting out with leaps, uh, there, there are no uh, specific, uh, I would say, prerequisites that you need to have, be it from a programming perspective or having, you know, a prior knowledge, a prior technical knowledge, be it from an engineering background or a statistical background. Uh, all these backgrounds definitely would help. Uh, you know, to get you uh, a closer understanding. But even if you are starting out uh, without any of these aspects, uh, with, do, with some basic understanding of uh, mathematics, uh, I think we have courses today that, you know, can help you bring up to speed uh, because a lot of these courses are not just uh, theoretical courses that will help you to gain theoretical knowledge, but they are applied courses. And they have been divided into different uh, categories, I would say, in terms of, uh, you know, some very basic, which will actually cover a lot of building blocks in terms of, uh, you know, what your, some of the basic statistical concepts are, uh, not just from a theoretical perspective, but you how you take those concepts and you start building an analytical solution. Uh, we have all gone through, uh, you know, in our school, colleges, uh, we all know what a mean, median mode is, but uh, how do you leverage a mean, median mode to build an analytical solution? Uh, so a lot of these courses uh, will focus on those aspects where they give you ex the exposure to uh, have an understanding of the underlying data. You're given a data set available to you uh, where you can then start applying uh, these concepts hands-on and then you kind of bring together these simple concepts to form an analytical approach. So in a nutshell, uh, there are no prerequisites. Uh, it's very, very applied. So the more you spend time on it, uh, you know, practice makes all of us perfect. So you'll get close to perfect. Well said, Mahalo. So uh, your answer actually covers a couple of more questions which were around uh, the courses and how is the structure of it. Uh, can you uh, tell on the uh, topic of courses, can you tell like how uh, how does Leaps or Antica chooses the courses and uh, you know, how do they integrate that into our platform? Like what's the design or thought behind uh, integrating a course? Sure. So uh, today, for example, let me just quickly, uh, so the way I see, I think there are two parts to that question. One is in terms of, you know, what all courses or content is available. And second, uh, what is the structure of a course itself? Yeah. So I can give you a quick walkthrough in terms of uh, what the structure is, uh, and then we'll come to the thought process. Uh, so as part of the structure, as you see, uh, you know, there are, uh, once you enroll into a course, you will have an overview, which talks a little bit about, uh, you know, the, what can you expect from the course? There is a timeline, uh, which can give you a quicker sense in the, the different modules that you will cover as part of the course. Uh, once you successfully are able to complete the course, uh, you are awarded a certificate from Analytica. Uh, again, these are not very, uh, these are not the only theoretical courses. These are very, very applied courses where the focus is actually, uh, as you enter into a course, it's divided into different modules, uh, you, you know, which you can think of it uh, as different chapters of a book. And, uh, as you start, so for example, you have an overview, uh, you'd be given some learning resources, a module structure, a suggested learning flow in terms of, you know, how should I go about it? And uh, as part of it, you will have some initial guidance available to you in terms of reading materials, uh, audio visuals aid available that you can consume at your own time. These you can actually, uh, you know, all of it can be accessed through your mobile devices as well. Uh, but the focus of the course, uh, you know, the applied course lies in these data cases that we have, where uh, as part of the data case, you will be laid out a learning goal, you will have a business scenario laid out for you. Uh, you will, uh, and as you proceed, these different business scenarios are then uh, broken down into different milestones, where I can actually start focusing on solving these based on what my uh, milestone objectives are. And uh, so I can focus on my milestone objectives, solve for that, uh, submit my results. One summit, I am. I can actually access something which is very unique to the platform itself, where I can actually go and see uh, how my, as a user, I did versus if an expert was solving the problem. Uh, you know how they did solve the problem. Now, as I'm kind of solving this out, uh, as a user, I'm not really getting penalized in terms of you know if I'm doing something extra. But we are also trying to. Uh, push you in terms of the right direction that, you know, uh, there, is, there is sort of a champion challenger concept here where 
if there is a solution that's available, there's an approach. And if you're able to uh, modify and better that approach, actually that approach becomes, uh, you know, the expert approach. So as you're going through these uh, courses, these data cases become the heart of the course where you have to uh, take on a very applied approach. Then there are quizzes which help you to focus on, you know, uh, once you have gone through the course, what my answers are, now you can have right and wrong answers. And uh, this will kind of help you to, again, you know, hone in on refining the aspects where you see uh, you could have done better. So this is a structure of a course. And, you know, again, uh, we completely believe in the aspect that this has to be uh, applied. Uh, you know, nobody can be a data science practitioner if they are just going through, uh, you know, some theoretical concepts. You have to start applying uh, yourself, what you're learning, uh, bring those concepts together to form an analytical approach. And so that's, that's what we're trying to bring together as well uh, as part of these courses. Uh, now, coming to the second part of the question, uh, you know, how these courses are chosen. So today we have uh, brought in certain set of courses, uh, some of them being basic, like basics of data analytics, uh, fundamentals of time series analysis, so you can get started around these concepts. Uh, then there are some, uh, you know, approaches like logistic regression, machine learning, linear regression, uh, objectives, uh, concepts of segmentation, right? So these are some of the very, very I would say commonly used techniques uh, across the analytical uh, continuum. So uh, having a sense of, you know, having applied knowledge of these will definitely give you an edge. And there is a very strong connect in terms of what the courses available out there and the apply section, right? So we have a plethora of content of different cases. Now these cases are sort of tying back to some aspect of the course. So for example, we saw a different classification, a course on different classification techniques. So here you have a, co a case where you are actually taking some of those classification techniques and seeing how to apply that in a very independent scenario in the banking and financial services domain. So you are then kind of, you know, honing on to those skills. You are, you went through the course, you uh, did a lot of those data cases available in the course as part of a business scenario, but then how do you uh, come out of that and, you know, apply the same technique in a different scenario? So then there is a connection between those. Uh, you can actually, you know, uh, before even jumping in, you can have a complete understanding of what this case is about, uh, what is the data available inside that, have an understanding if you want to jump in it. You can quickly clone this out. So, you, you know, you this will basically create a new data case available to you with this data set, and then you're just ready to kick off. You, you start solving for these. Yeah. Thanks, Madhav. So uh, one question uh, is coming that we are getting from Samuel is, uh, so I'm a project controls engineer uh, interested in data analytics to be applied in my working life. Uh, the background in industrial mathematics would be handy for me. Do you think that data science can be uh, you know, a good shift for me? Uh, that's from Samuel, right? Yeah. Yeah, great question, Samuel. Uh, I think again, uh, you know, you already have a strong quant uh, background uh, in, in terms of mathematics, right? So uh, absolutely, uh, you know, someone with the, that background definitely can make over the switch towards data science. Uh, again, I, I think I'll kind of, you know, take some of Rajiv's words here that uh, data science also doesn't mean that, you know, you are just kind of learning something new, but there's also an unlearning required. So today, you know, we are working with some of the biggest uh, businesses in India uh, and globally, uh, even in the manufacturing domain. So where we are using a lot of, uh, you know, these mathematical processes, statistical quality control processes. So uh, a lot of uh, these people are very good from a process perspective, from a Six Sigma perspective, they have deep learning in terms of, you know, how that business goes through from a manufacturing process, uh, which is very, very intensive. But now uh, to kind of develop an aptitude to start thinking, uh, to apply, to get insights of that data, not from a Six Sigma perspective, which is predominantly a process improvement uh, objective, but from an insight perspective, uh, you know, there, there's some unlearning needed as well. But uh, that unlearning, you know, as you kind of start developing that thought process as to how I can take some of these concepts that I have learned in terms of, you know, my standard deviation, my, my variations happening in the process, and then start leveraging those uh, from an analytical perspective, how can I add a mean to it to see to understand, you know, that uh, not just the distribution of the process, but does the overall distribution, is it following a normal distribution or not? Uh, you know, that unlearning can really help you speed up that uh, overall journey. 
and uh, definitely can you know uh, get you started on that data science path much faster as well. So it, it, it would be a combination of uh, some unlearning, making sure that you are open to accept some of the new approaches that will come together uh, in terms of you know taking your past experience and knowledge and then how it can be fitted into more of a thought process uh, from a data science perspective to solve the given objective. Well said, Madhav. Uh, I think that uh, we are getting similar questions from uh, all across the board. Uh, that answers uh, to those questions as well. Uh, I got a one technical question uh, from Rajini, which says uh, that in the use case presented for the stub classification, uh, the review will also need con uh, contextual embeddings. Uh, however, uh, but I, uh, she doesn't think that word to wick may not be able to capture that uh, for the review process. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, so uh, well said, Rajni. I think definitely every solution and objective, you know, has uh, its advantages and some challenges. Now, uh, in our objective, we were able to, you know, get a lot of uh, good results and the accuracy that you're we looking for, uh, leveraging the word to wick algorithm. Uh, in a review process where you, we might have missed those embeddings, so, you know, we would have tried to, uh, again, tweak that approach. And again, as I mentioned, right, that uh, a lot of the success that we achieved were for among the top two to three deciles. But for the rest of it, uh, you know, we took an approach where we were taking a combination of results coming from the neural network as well as uh, different results coming from other classification algorithms. And then we took the approach of, you know, applying the highest available probability uh, for the classification so that you know our goal is in terms of if we can get the right classification versus what is the algorithm we are using so from that perspective in that case we were able to attain what we we're looking for and uh, as a prototype to sort of uh, you know get that uh, a solution uh, to a next level you know that's where we're trying to focus on the BERT algorithm as well uh, which should solve for some of those review and embedding aspects also but a challenge on the bird perspective is that you know it requires very high computational power, so uh, it's not always the go-to algorithm. At least when you're kind of starting out with a business perspective, which always has some constraint, be it from a cost or time perspective. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so with this, mother, uh, I like to bring uh, this Q and A session to the end, and uh, <clears throat> like to thank you. And I would also like to thank you all the participants who have been there with us. Uh, so all our uh, panelists, Rajiv, Satyamaya, Madhav, uh, are available on LinkedIn. If you have any questions, further questions, uh, you can reach out to uh, them on LinkedIn, or you can reach out to Analytica's FB page or our Twitter handle, and we will be more than happy to connect with you. So with that, uh, I'd like to say thank you for all of us joining today uh, from different parts of the world and uh, from different time zones. So it's good evening here. Uh, I think it's good night somewhere else. And good morning or good afternoon. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, the recording of this uh, video uh, will be available on, or this event will be available on our YouTube channel. We'll be posting it uh, later on our Facebook channels and excerpt from this on the event channel and our Twitter handles. So feel free uh, to go through it, follow us uh, on social media. And uh, as Madhav mentioned that starting uh, next week, we'll be having, uh, we are kicking off our webinars and that's our hands-on sessions on different data cases that are available on uh, ATH Leaps platform. There, uh, we will be solving a business question uh, with uh, analytical backend. So how do you use uh, analytics or data science to solve an actual business problem? And uh, we have, uh, you know, starting next week, uh, these sessions, hand-on session will start. So watch out for our emails, our invites in your uh, inbox, and we'll be sending them out. And in the meantime, you can go ahead uh, to the webinar section of the leaps, register them there, uh, le register yourself there, and we'll be reaching out to you. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you everyone and wrap this session up. Uh, thank you, Rajiv, thank you, Satyamoy and Madhav for taking out time uh, you know, and uh, walking us through 
some of the very interesting topics uh, ranging from uh, business to uh, AI. Great, thank you, Varun. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.